Hi, I'm Scott Bolvier, host of eConversations and director of the Johnson Center for Political Economy here at Troy University. Happy New Year to you all, and thanks for tuning in to our show. Tonight, we have a very distinguished and special guest uh, joining us on set, Larry Reed from the Foundation for Economic Education, which is based both in New York and also in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he's, uh, one of, he's the president of the Foundation for Economic Education and one of the more important uh, uh, contributors to free market ideas and free enterprise, reaching thousands of students each year with the summer programs and uh, uh, with the uh, Freeman magazine subscription that is put out uh, quite regularly on a monthly basis, reaching many, many thousands more as well. Larry, it's great to have you on the show tonight. And uh, we're going to talk about the Great Depression, but I'd like to just first have you uh, summarize what it's like being president of FEE and what you all do to reach people with free enterprise ideas. Well, thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, FEE is uh, 66 years old now. We were founded in 1946 by the late Leonard Reed, no relation, <laughs> but a wonderful man uh, who contributed a great deal to free market ideas. Uh, we are an educational organization focused now on 16 to 24 year olds uh, with summer seminars for high school and college students, uh, shorter programs for that audience all over the country during the academic year. We publish a magazine called The Freeman uh, you can access that online at no charge uh, from uh, fee.org. And uh, we're committed to advancing free, free enterprise ideas with a focus on relative newcomers, young people uh, for whom these ideas are relatively new. We're hoping they'll go on to become uh, opinion leaders, activists in some way on behalf of the ideas that we think made America great. Mm -hmm. One of the ideas that I think uh, people who are young and in the age group that uh, you're trying to reach are most uh, misinformed on is the Great Depression. Yes. And uh, the idea that it was the stock market that caused the Great Depression and speculation uh, that just caused um, the Depression of 1929. And they're getting this in high school, I think, right. uh, and also from generations of people who don't really understand the causes of the Depression. And you've written a very important uh, article titled The Great Myths of the Great Depression, and uh, that's what we're going to focus on tonight because it's relevant for students um, to understand their history, but also has some contemporary relevance when we try to understand the financial crisis as well. So what, what are the great myths of the Great Depression that um, you think students are being told that just aren't true? Well, there are many. Uh, and of course, the biggest myth is that somehow the free economy was just chugging along and then it fell apart of its own weight or uh, fell apart because of its own inherent flaws or contradictions, whatever. And then government had to come along, uh, principally in the administration of Franklin Roosevelt, and save us from the Depression. But uh, uh, an increasing number of economists are making a pretty strong case that just the opposite I is really uh, true that the economy fell apart in the late 1920s as a reflection of very erratic uh, monetary policy. You had expansion of the money and credit supply by the Federal Reserve, followed by a period of some three years from 29 to 33 of contraction of the money supply, uh, tumbling prices, and, the, and then a lot of things that Congress came in and did under two administrations, Republican and Democrat, that added to the burdens of doing business, that made uh, enterprise more costly, uh, loaded it with penalties and regulations, and prevented recovery for at least uh, a decade. You've done a lot of work as well on presidents. Um, is your account of the presidents leading up to the Depression, Hoover, and uh, I'm trying to remember them all, Coolidge, and, uh, I'm not good with my presidents, but the, the presidents leading us into the Depression have often been depicted as laissez-faire, committed to small government, balanced budgets, mm -hmm. um, tax cuts, you know, guys yeah. who, who were pro-business. Yeah. And um, in fact, was, was that the case? Uh, well, it was largely true with <laughs> Calvin Coolidge, yep. who uh, became president uh, when Harding died in August of 23, mm -hmm. and then served until uh, January of, or March of uh, 1929. Uh, he was uh, very committed to small government. Mm -hmm. Uh, but his successor, Herbert Hoover, was not. And so you do have history texts typically saying, well, Herbert Hoover was a stand pat, hands off, laissez faire, do nothing president. But he was all over the place uh, with his um, raising taxes. He, he doubled the income tax. He raised tariffs to an all time high. Uh, 
Uh, he had bailout programs. He had a reconstruction finance corporation, which looks a lot like a, many of the bailout programs of today. Uh, you don't have to take my word for it that Hoover was uh, a, a radical interventionist. That's what Franklin Roosevelt said when he ran against him in 32. He, he ran on a platform that called for a 25% reduction in federal spending. He attacked Hoover for, for raising spending, raising taxes, raising tariffs. His vice presidential running mate, uh, John Nance Garner from Texas, made the statement that Hoover was leading the country down the path to socialism. I mean, that's a word for word uh, quote. And there was a lot of truth to that because Hoover was doing all these things, which is quite the opposite, unfortunately, of what the typical textbook tells you today. Yeah, the typical textbook, let's still keep our focus on leading up to the Depression. So they tell us that you know Hoover was Mr. Laissez-faire in many cases. Uh, and they also tell us that it was the stock market, margin yeah. trading that drove us uh, into this crisis. You know, that yeah. people just suddenly became obsessed with what was happening yeah. on Wall Street, the ticker tape, and uh, there was this mania. Mm -hmm. um, how do you respond to that? My, my thinking has always been that stock markets um, kind of indicate what's happening in underlying, the underlying environment. Right. You know, maybe it's driven by policy or other things. And sometimes you can indeed have bubbles, but that's more of a symptom than a cause of you're a crisis. Is that your take on, on the history? Absolutely, you're yeah. absolutely right. The stock market was a mirror reflection of what, what, what the uh, Federal Reserve was doing with the money and credit supply. Mm -hmm. uh, e we had easy money during the so-called roaring 20s. Uh, the Federal Reserve was expanding the money supply, driving interest rates to historic lows, and much of that newly created cheap money found its way on the stock market. But when that policy of the Fed reversed itself, uh, or the Fed reversed it, to contraction of the money supply, well, that was like letting the air out of the balloon, and then the stock market crashed. Uh, but it was reflective of what was happening to money and credit. And by the way, this is not any longer uh, very much in dispute. Even Mr. Bernanke, who runs the Fed today, admitted publicly in the presence of the late economist Milton Friedman that it was the Fed that started the depression through its uh, very unwise monetary policy. Yeah, I think I remember him saying at his 90th birthday, you were right. Yeah, uh, exactly, yeah, we've, yeah. We've, we've learned this much from you. Yeah, we won't um, do it again, right, supposedly. Right. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the 29 to 33 period. Uh, you have unemployment that gets up as high as 25 percent, mm -hmm. official unemployment. Uh, unofficially, it was probably a lot higher. People mm -hmm. had just given up on finding jobs. Uh, you have one out of every three banks closing. Mm -hmm. um, you have a lot of uncertainty when it comes to policy. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, um, movements around the world that act, uh, ultimately spur totalitarianism yes. and Adolf Hitler and uh, Mussolini. Uh, what could have been done differently during that early period um, to, to, to try to right the crisis? You've mentioned that yeah. money let us into it, yes. and then we took the, you took the air out of the balloon. Is, are you suggesting that we should have just kept money um, uh, no, stable I, or printing a lot more of it? No, uh, what what well, could have been done? I think a more stable monetary policy mm -hmm. throughout the 20s and 30s would have been much more helpful instead mm -hmm. of this uh, boom and bust in money and credit, which then uh, had the same kind of impact on the economy. It's important to remember that in the spring of 1930, which was several months after the big crash on the stock market in the fall of 29, mm -hmm. we didn't have a depression yet. We only had a recession in the spring of 30. Unemployment was less than it is, or in the vicinity of where it is today, about eight and a half percent. That was not a depression yet. Uh, but something happened in June of 1930 to take a recession and make it a depression, and that was the uh, Smoot-Hawley tariff. Mm -hmm. That raised tariffs to an all-time high on foreign imports, virtually closed the borders, it ignited an international trade war. Any business practically involved in exporting or importing got really hit hard by Smoot-Hawley. And so Congress and the President took a recession and made it a depression in June of 1930. When we get to 32 and onward, uh, we have FDR showing up on the scene. And I think another myth that I, I've been told and that I've um, argued with relatives about who really mm -hmm. you know, believe in FDR is the idea that he ultimately provided some stability um, to the 1930s. He at least helped you know, secure a bottom. Yeah. Uh, in in 33 and yes it was a long slog out of it that we ultimately didn't escape until World War II mm -hmm. um, 
but he provided some confidence, and um, you know, he was the right guy at that time. Is is, is how how's what's yeah. the historical record on on that? part of the story. Well, yeah, we should point out that the very year he was elected, mm -hmm. 1932, uh, Hoover and the Republicans made another big mistake. Uh, they doubled the income tax. Mm -hmm. And so FDR inherited a mess that you could hardly imagine it could be any worse. Um, and you have to give him credit. He gave great speeches. Right. He inspired confidence. He gave fireside chats that people found mesmerizing. They were memorable. They mm -hmm. were inspirational. But that's apart from his policies. His policies did not have that same effect. They were actually keeping us in depression. He tried a little bit of everything. But the fact is, uh, on the eve of World War II, unemployment was still in the vicinity of 20%. Um, so he gave great speeches, but on policy, he kept us in depression. Not intentionally, mm -hmm. but that was the effect of uh, many of the destructive policies he put in place. Mm -hmm. When we get to World War II, uh, you know, we, we have this huge run-up in production, industrial production, and a lot of the data turn around during that period. Um, is it fair to say that it was the war that led us out of the Depression, or is this another part of the myth? Was there, were, the, were there other things finally changing in terms of fiscal policy, monetary policy, that were driving us uh, back onto a recovery? Well, with wars, you often get increasing deficit spending. And I'm not an advocate of deficit spending at any time. But with that deficit spending, you often get uh, an increase in the money and credit supply that because the central bank is trying to accommodate those deficits. It was the monetary jolt of, of a return to easy money that, uh, uh, at least temporarily, made things look a little bit better. It wasn't the war. Mm -hmm. When you think of you know, what is war, war is the destruction of resources. Mm -hmm. Now you may have to do it because you're fighting a, an avowed enemy, but we shouldn't confuse that with economic stimulus. Instead of making automobiles and refrigerators, we were making bombs and tanks and planes. And we took care of the official unemployment figures by shipping 11 million men overseas. Mm -hmm. But we didn't see an, an improvement in general standards of living. Mm -hmm. If anything, it, they may even have declined. We had rationing. Mm -hmm shortages, black markets, uh, until after the war. And after the war, and this is where some big spending type economists get it wrong, they like to say when the government spends more, it stimulates, when it spends less, it hurts the economy. But we saw the biggest reduction in government expenditures in American history when the war was over. And yet we saw a boom after the war. And I think that's, they're connected because we weren't diverting resources into destruction anymore. We were making them available for the private sector. Mm -hmm. Plus, we got a big reduction in 1945 in the corporate income tax mm -hmm. uh, from 90% to 38. Wow. And that made a huge difference in uh, the willingness of people to invest. Sure. Why is it that these myths persist? Uh, and why can't you know people just recognize that it's a lot murkier. The truth, the truth isn't that the stock market drove us into the crisis, and the truth isn't that Hoover yeah. and his predecessors were these wildcat capitalists, and yeah. the truth isn't that uh, FDR was our savior either. Yeah. Um, are they just the easier um, route to go when, when teaching and educating young people about it? Or is there maybe some kind of an agenda that, that people have? Um, what's, what's driving the myths? I think it's probably some of both. Mm -hmm. Certainly there has been an agenda. If, if you're an advocate of more government, uh, then you're going to be more open to suggest that uh, FDR, who gave us a lot more of it, mm -hmm. uh, somehow succeeded. Uh, but if you look at the evidence, you have to realize that he really didn't. It, it, the Depression was prolonged by what he did. I think, too, uh, so much of this is wrapped up in partisan politics. Uh, the further removed we are from that period, with people not tied into the emotions of the day and the parties and so forth, they look back and increasingly the scholarship is more objective. And it's increasingly concluding that it wasn't FDR that got us out of the Depression. Uh, we muddled along in spite of what he was trying to do. We didn't recover because of what he did. Mm -hmm. Let's try to connect the Great Depression up to um, the current landscape in America. We suffered perhaps the worst recession since the Depression, beginning in 2008, maybe late 2007, mm -hmm. the Great Recession. Uh, if you look at data on unemployment, this one's been particularly bad uh, in that 
job losses from the peak. It's deeper mm -hmm. than any other recession we've had since World War II. Yes. Um, if you look at how long the unemployment has persisted relative to what the experts said, mm -hmm. uh, it's much higher. Uh, mm -hmm. Team Obama projected that we'd be at 6% unemployment right now, and those yeah. are very smart economists yeah. who projected that. Uh, we're actually at 85 or so. Yeah. Um, what lessons can you take from the Great Depression and say, here are the parallels, yeah. uh, and what can you take from the Great Depression and say, let's not do that again yeah. when looking at the current um, economic environment in the U.S.? This one, it wasn't stock run up so much, mm -hmm. but housing that led us into it in terms of easy money producing yeah. a lot of homes and then uh, somewhat of a bubble in housing. Uh, yeah. what, can we, what are the takeaways, I guess? Well, a big one is the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yeah. I mean, at the core of this current crisis, you had a very expansionary policy of the Federal Reserve earlier in the last decade. Uh, after 9-11, uh, for several years you had the Fed keeping interest rates extraordinarily low. These cycles always have their own uh, idiosyncrasies, but in this last one, uh, because of the easy money and because of policies of Congress and regulatory agencies, a lot of that money found its way not to the stock market, but rather into the housing market. You had policies of government uh, jawboning banks to make loans to people who really couldn't uh, pay them back. Uh, and so much of that easy money with dirt cheap interest rates for a time was causing a bubble in the um, housing market. The, the lesson of that is government shouldn't be picking winners and losers. It ought to follow a sound and stable monetary policy. It shouldn't try to pump up any particular industry because all it does is create a bubble and sets you up for a bust. Mm -hmm. Uh, but they don't seem to be taking to that in Washington in so many ways. They're doing the same things all over again. Yeah. So when we say that the, the monetary authorities shouldn't be creating bubbles through easy money, um, how do you tie their hands? They're this independent entity yeah. um, that you know, is really tough to affect. Ron Paul has called for auditing and yeah. some greater accountability. There are a few people out there who say we should return to a gold standard, but it's really yeah. tough to see that happening. Mm -hmm. Bernanke says he's committed to monetary rules. You know, yeah. We're going to hit a certain inflation target or yeah. interest rate target. Um, none of these things seem like they're really on the plate in terms of policy. Do we just yeah. muddle along with the Fed as it is? Um, or are there, there some real good policy alternatives to Well, there are, and there are multiple options. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think you have to start with the recognition that the Fed has uh, been at the source of a great deal of trouble. Mm -hmm. And it hasn't lived up to the promises that it made or that Congress made for it. When it was created almost 100 years ago, we were told it will give us just the right amount of money, it will protect the integrity of the currency, it'll promote full employment, you know, all these things, iron out the business cycle. But yet look what we've got. We've had one Great Depression that the current Fed chairman even says was caused by the Fed, nine or 10 recessions, and a dollar that's worth a nickel of what it was when they started. So that to me suggests we ought to be going beyond the Fed and asking ourselves, how do we put market discipline in charge of this matter of what should the money supply be mm -hmm. instead of politicians and people they appoint? Uh, we wouldn't do that with the green bean supply. Why should we do it with the money supply? Mm -hmm. When you look at uh, what the Fed's been up to since 2008, um, yes, the bubble in housing seems to have burst, but are we out of the woods on um, you know, the bubble fully bursting. I mean, a, yeah. a typical symptom of a bubble bursting is the interest rates get cranked up, yeah. and then you've taken the, like the Great Depression, you've taken the air out of the yeah. balloon. Uh, this time, if you look at data on money supply figures, if you look mm -hmm. at what the Fed's been doing, it's been anything but that, right? Aren't they responding in a way that suggests they're putting a lot more money into circulation? They're, they're buying toxic assets. Yeah. Interest yeah. rates are guaranteed to be at zero until like the end of 2013. Yeah. And now we have Europe, which could mm -hmm. be um, something that requires major Fed intervention. So yeah. where does that leave us? Um, I know it's hard to forecast going mm -hmm. forward, but where does that leave us? Um, as far as like future mm -hmm. bubbles go, are we, yeah. are we on the cusp of another one um, because of their actions? Or Well, it's clear the Fed has been injecting a lot of reserves uh, into the, the system, uh, but the problem has been, of course, that's where they've stayed. Yeah. For the most part, they haven't worked their way out of the banks and into the pockets of ordinary Americans. But that's understandable because there isn't a whole lot of confidence mm -hmm. for people to want to go and borrow money and then invest it. Mm -hmm. And that's because of 
the political climate in Washington as much as anything. We, business people, investors don't know, you know what's coming down the pike, uh, but they have pretty good reason to believe it's going to be higher taxes, more spending, bigger deficits. It's not the kind of environment where you want to go borrow and invest or create a business. Uh, so uh, it, it's as if the Fed is trying to create another bubble, but they're sort of pushing on a string, you might say. That's an old phrase mm -hmm. that indicates uh, it's not taking. But there are signs now that maybe it, it is. Mm -hmm. And so in the short run, we might get a lift. But I worry about what it means for the longer run, that we really haven't gotten off this merry-go-round or this mm -hmm. roller coaster of erratic monetary policy. Mm -hmm. We're just setting ourselves up for another bust. Business confidence seems to be a theme, both in the Depression and today, in yeah. terms of um, being a necessity to encourage a recovery. You have investors sitting on cash. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of businessmen, you know, who I, I've spoken with some anecdotally, and you hear this if you just pay attention to the news at all, mm -hmm. they're saying we, we just don't know yeah. um, what's ahead in terms of new regulation, uh, perhaps new health care mandates yeah. and whatnot. Um, uh, was there any effort to inspire business confidence in the Great Depression that had any teeth? And now when we look at today, how would you do that yeah. um, besides just you know, rhetoric? Yeah. Um, what, do you, what needs to be done to mm -hmm. encourage uh, confidence today? Well, in the 30s, uh, FDR had a war on business right up until the uh, uh, World War II began. And you saw that in the form of not only his rhetoric, but his uh, tax proposals. He attacked Hoover for raising the top income tax rate from 24 to 65 percent, but before he was done, he raised it to 92 yeah. percent. Uh, and at one point, he even proposed a 100 percent tax on all incomes over $25,000. So, uh, you know, that's the kind of environment that just kept business uh, in the doldrums. And you're seeing the same kind of thing with the current administration. They are piling on the taxes and the regulations. I wonder why anybody yeah. would want to take a risk right now. If there were one thing that you could do in the way of uh, fiscal or monetary policy to um, encourage growth right now, yeah, what, what, would, what would it be? I suppose it could be a mix of things, but is it, is it regulation that's the big problem, or is it taxes? Oh, it's or? certainly a big one, uh -huh. but I would say the first and foremost thing uh, is to balance the budget, mm -hmm. and to balance it not through tax hikes, uh, hikes but through spending reductions. Mm -hmm. If you could achieve a balanced budget, or at least convince people we're on a path to that within a short period of time, and not through tax hikes, you would do more to, uh, to create confidence in the future than just about anything else I can think of. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, if you look at that period at the end of World War II, you, had, you have evidence right there, yeah. uh, going back in history, of slashing government spending yeah. and growth that's actually happening as well. Exactly. Um, perhaps an underappreciated um, period in American history, because as you pointed out a few minutes ago, um, the model right now is that if we dare to cut government spending yeah. right now, mm -hmm. um, we're going to choke the recovery. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where we, when we slash spending after World War II, we release those resources from government use mm -hmm. for the private sector to put to better use. Mm -hmm. And it actually was helpful in creating uh, the post-war boom. Mm -hmm. One other thing I want to um, just talk about before we, we go is this, these ideas of moral hazard and too big to mm -hmm. fail. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the concern in 2008, the argument really came down to how far mm -hmm. could a crisis or, you know, could, uh, how much contagion is there in the system, say yeah. if Lehman fails or if mm -hmm. Citigroup fails, versus what precedent are we setting if yeah. we bail them out? Yeah. Um, and this idea, ultimately, the Fed came down on the side of, you know, some some entities are just yeah. too big to fail, or perhaps too politically connected to fail. Yeah. Um, City was allowed to be propped mm -hmm. up. Yeah. Um, Layman was allowed to fail. Yeah. So there was some some real problems with the directions they let the two companies go. Um, is this the new normal for us yeah. in uh, uh, in U.S. monetary policy and uh, just mm -hmm. you know the U.S. Uh, economy as a whole? If you're a big enough bank, yeah. if you're a big enough company, GM isn't a yeah. bank, and yeah. they weren't allowed to fail. Really, um, uh, is is this where we're at? Well, today? there's no question. If we had allowed failures instead of uh, uh, the bailouts, we'd have had a sharper downturn, but we would have had a sharper uh, rep uh, response and, and rebound. Yeah. Uh, saying that uh, they're too big to fail is kind of like saying you're too drunk to get sober. Uh, it seems to me that if the problem is drunkenness, you've got to dry out, mm -hmm. and uh, you don't hand the guy another bottle, and yet that's what uh, this government has been doing. Yeah. 
I'm going to leave it there, and I really appreciate you being down here to visit us. I look forward to your talk tonight. I think it's going to be great. Uh, tonight, you're talking about free trade versus protectionism, yes. and I bet you there may even be a mention of Smoot Hawley in there. Yeah, probably. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks again for, uh, for being with us My today. My pleasure, Scott. And thank you, viewers, for tuning in tonight to our show. Good night.